Well, uh, welcome to Design at Large uh, for the fall quarter. This speaker series is brought to you by the Design Lab, and uh, we've had so far over 100 speakers, uh, a fairly diverse group of speakers, all interesting, all talking about topics that um, intersect with design. Uh, and today it's my incredibly special pleasure uh, to introduce Nan Renner. Uh, uh, I first met Nan uh, probably a little over a decade ago, uh, and she came to our lab uh, to chat with us. Uh, and at that time, she was an exhibit developer for the National History Museum down in Balboa Park. And I was incredibly impressed by her. I mean, her interest in learning and in sort of designing experiences in uh, a museum uh, kind of setting. Uh, and I remember thinking after she left that day, that gee, it would be really great to have someone like that apply to graduate school. Uh, and, uh, and like everything I think that would be good, it just happens. Uh, and Nan applied, uh, and we were very fortunate about that. And uh, I remember writing a letter for her uh, for a fellowship, uh, which she received. And uh, we're even more fortunate that she joined our distributed cognition at HCI lab. Uh, and, uh, and that was the beginning of our relationship. Uh, and like with others of your best students, uh, your main job is just to stay out of their way. Uh, and, uh, and I tried to do that with Nan. Uh, and Nan is uh, sort of a natural ethnographer. Uh, she has just incredible talents in that. And, and she chose as her field site uh, the uh, museum where she had been working and had relationships. Uh, and uh, her dissertation was titled, Free to Explore a Museum, Embodied Inquiry and Multimodal Expression uh, of Meaning. Uh, and, and, and in it, she sort of demonstrated her uh, ability to see and document uh, the richness of children experiencing uh, a museum and learning in that setting. Uh, she's now director of learning, design, and innovation at the Birch Aquarium at Scripps, uh, just across the street. Uh, and before she begins, I have uh, some other things to tell you about Nan uh, that you might not know. Uh, her undergraduate degree is from Northwestern uh, in art theory and practice. Uh, Everyone who knows Nan knows that she's an organic gardener uh, and an excellent one at that. Uh, what you might not know is that she can whistle with her fingers, uh, that uh, uh, she knows and has worked in every museum in Balboa Park. Uh, she was part of a, a parent cooperative that started successful charter school. Uh, and, uh, and being a student of a, of a surfer like me, uh, she keeps a wetsuit in her car, uh, and she's always prepared to jump in the ocean. Uh, she also keeps a two and a half gallon thing of water, and she can completely shower uh, successfully with that, that water. How did you know all this stuff? I know all this stuff. <laughs> uh, even sort of more important, uh, she's a real uh, activist. She's involved in numerous causes, uh, trying to enable and and to create a more sustainable and just world. Uh, you know, students, PhD students, always become friends, but a few of them become dear friends. And Nan is certainly one of my dear friends. Uh, and so let's welcome her to talk about uh, value-driven design and connecting a university community. So, Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the honor of speaking with you today. And, and I hope to deliver on Jim's promise of making this an interesting talk. In addition to serving as Senior Director of Learning, Design, and Innovation at Birch Aquarium at Scripps, I'm also part of the CREATE STEM Success Initiative. CREATE is a center here on campus that's dedicated to equity in education. CREATE stands for the Center for Research on Educational Equity, Assessment, and Teaching Excellence. So I'm going to try to show you today how we're working together 
Birch Aquarium at Scripps, Create STEM Success in Initiative, and how we're working with other partners here on main campus at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and how we want to build on that work. Birch Aquarium at Scripps sits in an extraordinary geographic location here on the campus of UC San Diego, part of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, in a, a coastal reserve facing marine protected areas with a million dollar view of the Pacific Ocean, we've got a really sweet spot and we want to make the most of it. We also are in a unique place in time as an organization. Since the beginning of, of Scripps Institution of Oceanography in 1913, there has been a public aquarium intended to engage people in the research at Scripps. We've been in this location now 26 years on the Hill, and we are much beloved by the community. And we're ready for the next chapter in our evolution. We're using our mission and our values to focus our work in the present and into the future. Over the past year and a half or so, we engaged our staff and other stakeholders in developing a new mission. We connect understanding to protecting our ocean planet. This mission expresses what we value. It expresses a commitment to knowledge and to action informed by knowledge. This participatory process with staff also generated some overt value statements. And using these values, engage, inspire, empower, community and collaboration, sustainability, innovation and play, I will use these values as a backbone for my talk today to, to tell you a visual story of recent and current projects connecting our aquarium with Scripps and with the UC San Diego campus and the community at large. And with each value, I will extend to you an invitation to work with us as partners toward shared goals. And I, I have to make an announcement. We um, had tried to arrange an American Sign Language interpreter for the talk today as, as part of a, a demonstration of our commitment to inclusivity. And unfortunately, that interpreter had to cancel due to illness. And the office here on campus who arranges the interpreters um, could not find a replacement. So um, I apologize to anyone who is expecting ASL interpretation. And we will try to do more of that in the future. OK, so back to the talk. Values as a backbone. But first, I want to give you a little background. How many of you have been to Birch Aquarium at Scripps? Oh, yay. So we have some, some folks with familiarity. OK. Well, our visitor research, which is consistent with research at similar organizations, shows us that people come to the aquarium to see live animals, of course, and to you know, experience the wonders of the ocean world. They want to see and do things there that they can't see and do anywhere else. They also tell us in huge numbers that they come to the aquarium to spend time with family and friends. So that speaks to the social imperative of how we approach design of these spaces. And we know from other studies that, that family visitors express their values and how they choose to spend their leisure time. So values at multiple levels here. And as a public aquarium for over 100 years, we uh, exist to engage people in Scripps research, research in labs, on Scripps Pier, and in the field. And um, here's an example of some cutting edge technology and underwater microscope developed by the Jaffe Lab. Our work in the present and future is not contained within our walls but extending out into the university campus, the community, our nearby coastal reserve, and the ocean beyond. So a question that we wrestle with pretty much every day, and maybe you do too, is how do we manage this complexity? This is our grand challenge. We've got great complexity of scientific content, 
complexity in the array of content options. We have complexity of audiences. They have different wants and needs, different prior knowledge. And we're committed to using human-centered design principles, integrating how people think, how they behave, how they're organized socially as we design spaces and experiences for people. And we also aim to link human-centered design with community-centered design so that we really are serving the multiple communities in which we're embedded. And in making our mission real, we have to grapple with the complexity of what does it take to build knowledge and to move that knowledge into action. So the examples that I share with you today about our work at, at Birch Aquarium, how it connects with Scripps Oceanography and UC San Diego, is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. And I promise I don't have a sunset picture at the end. <laughs> Although, it's almost sunset. Okay. To help us manage the complexity at the aquarium, we wanted to establish common ground for shared practices. And our executive director, Harry Helling, who's pictured here, wanted to be here with us today, but um, is unable to. He asked us to develop a design process that would organize our work. And honestly, we're still learning how to use this design process. And there are some people in this room who contributed to this design process as well. And there are people in this room who inspired our design process. Um, what is not showing up on the projection is this is meant to be a double diamond. And maybe you all have encountered the double diamond of design. And what, what that means, what design thinking means, is that before rushing to design solutions, we really want to understand what is the problem, what is the opportunity, what's the challenge, what's the need. And so we need to spend time really articulating our goals and, and framing that opportunity so that we understand what we're shooting for. And there are some references here. Stretched over several months, our staff contributed to this new mission and values, as well as our design direction for the future. And we had a series of workshops that, that sought to harvest the creativity of all of our staff, and then represent those ideas in text and images that was then transformed into a program report to work with architects Miller Hole in this conceptual design phase. Oh, let me back up here. Actually, this, this is an important theme for us in, in articulating our goal. It's, it's a big, broad goal that we need to give form to, but we aim to be a world-class aquarium and a behind-the-scenes Scripps oceanography experience. So really connecting people in authentic ways to that, that inquiry process of how we build new knowledge. And in our explorations, we engaged in internal reflection on our organizational strengths and weaknesses, our mission impact and potential for mission impact, our business model, how, how we maintain financial viability and sustainability. We're also engaged in ongoing learning about the research and facilities at Scripps, such as the hydraulics lab, fondly referred to as the H lab, which is a combination engineering and makerspace and research facility, which is, is now building the, maybe the world's largest atmospheric ocean and biological simulator, SOARS, the Scripps Ocean and Atmosphere Research Simulator, with funding from National Science Foundation. Um, we'll, we'll return to this idea of the H lab. That's outside, that's inside. We also engaged in competitive analysis of, of other informal STEM learning environments. And there's a whole lot more work to do as, as we put flesh on the bones of our vision. <coughs> Just a little more context and then we'll get to the stories. We also engaged in a deep analysis of our site the opportunities and constraints related to topography and vegetation and fire risk, et cetera. 
and <clears throat> we're engaged now in doing architectural studies for this next chapter in our organization. We are not expanding, we are revitalizing or reimagining Birch Aquarium at Scripps. And as I share this information with you, I, I hope to pique your interest to invite you to participate in ways that, that maybe we haven't imagined yet. And there are some things that we want to keep kind of close to our vest. So there are some slides that I'll show and I'll ask you not to take photographs of those slides because we're not ready to release it to the general public. You are part of our insider group and so we're, we're sharing this information with you to, to pique your interest and, and build your engagement. And we will um, share this with the general public after January 1st, 2019. Okay. So values-driven design. I'm going to share with you a series of examples of small-scale exploratory projects and talk about how they orient us toward our future. I want to try to tease out how we're using human-centered design and community-centered design principles and invite you into our problem space with values as touch points. So this first value, this is about active exploration, it's about the emotions of awe and curiosity and wonder, love for nature, diversity of life. It's about asking questions and exploring at the frontiers of discovery with, with our research community here. And it's about empowering action informed by knowledge for a healthy planet with a spirit of hope and optimism. At present, we have many inquiry-based education programs at the aquarium, on the Scripps campus, and in schools. And there is a great need for science education and STEM learning pathways more broadly. And we have boundless resources to fuel this effort. <clears throat> this is on Scripps Pier drawing up water samples. Scripps Pier is an observation deck for scientists with limited access to small groups of students and the general public. But if we go below the pier, we can enter another world. This is a, a picture of uh, um, a researcher cleaning the Scripps plankton camera system, also developed by the Jaffe Lab. And this system takes micro photographs of, of live plankton in their environment at two different scales and is delivered in real time to a website that is available to the general public. The images are beautiful and inspiring, but they're also profoundly meaningful if we know how to look at them and how to use them. So with this abundance of plankton image data, we can connect this opportunity of, of, of so many resources with a real need. And working with the Create STEM Success Initiative, we know that there is a, a profound need for meaningful STEM learning in grades K through 12 including especially computer science, where we see tremendous inequity of access to computer science learning opportunities. The Create STEM Success Initiative serves as a bridge between this top tier research university and the K-12 community, really sharing resources and engaging school districts, schools, teachers, and students in, in real world authentic STEM learning. So a project that we did in collaboration with CREATE was a, a teacher professional development workshop called Plankton and Computational Thinking. So bringing together disciplines, striving toward a more authentic approach to science learning. Computational thinking in, in its grandest sense is about taking a big problem and breaking it down into smaller parts parts that could be done by a computer. 
So in, in this case, our teachers sorted the plankton images into categories based on similarity and then wrote step-by-step -step instructions or an algorithm to define how a computer could do this task of image recognition and classification. And then they tested their algorithms and debugged it. This is an unplugged CS activity, so you don't need to have computers to teach computer science. So the Create STEM Success Initiative, in collaboration with Birch Aquarium, aims to give teachers access to people, ideas, and resources to engage their students, and to demonstrate the essential role of computing in scientific research. And we did this in collaboration with Darcy Taniguchi, who is a professor at Cal State San Marcos, a Scripps Oceanography alumnus and former postdoc. Darcy led and she designed and led the workshop. And we used a kind of expert apprentice model where here at, at this um, part of the workshop, Darcy gave us a look under the hood at her computational models of plankton, carbon cycling, and climate. And what we aim to do in a bigger sense is to demystify data, computing, and computational models. And we're always asking, with these pilot projects, how do we scale them? How do we use existing networks to activate this work? And how do we make the work relevant to people? Why should we care about plankton? So for each one of us, as we sit in this room, you might count every other breath and thank the plankton, the phytoplankton, for producing the oxygen that we're breathing. So our lives depend on the plankton. That's one connection. And plankton also serve as the base of the ocean food web. So we're going from micro to macro here. And, and looking at, um, this is Scripps Campus and Scripps Pier. Here we can see in this photograph, an har a harmful algal bloom. So some plankton are beneficial to us and some, in abundance, can be harmful to ecosystems and to people. So the, the uh, human-centered design principle of, of making it relevant to people, motivating people in this activity, needs to address that question, why should we care? And here, another resource, the Southern California Coastal Ocean Observing System, uh, housed at Scripps Oceanography, part of a national network, is tracking these kinds of harmful algal blooms as well as general oceanographic conditions. And part of this complexity that we're dealing with is we want to put the micro into uh, make connections with macro scales, we want to put the local in context with regional and global phenomena. And here's an, an image representing uh, a harmful algal bloom off the coast of California. Here using the, the data um, from chlorophyll concentrations to, um, as a proxy for this um, harmful diatom that contains a, a neurotoxin. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, you're, you know, you're not supposed to eat the shellfish when this pseudonychia is in bloom. So we want to co connect ecological events with climate patterns using data. We want to engage people in exploring cause and effect re relations and understanding complex systems. And I wanna, I'm going to show you a secret picture now about how we imagine doing that. So no photographs, please. <laughs> this is a, an, a design study that reimagines the entrance to Birch Aquarium at Scripps. And here we, we want to, um, to project to people that we are an aquarium, but also a behind-the-scenes Scripps oceanography experience with instruments and equipment out on display, with data being generated in real time that people can play with, manipulate, visualize. We want to use these data sets and make them available to teachers so that they can engage their students in, in meaningful research, maybe even contributing to long-term data sets in a citizen science model. We want to democratize data and computing, and we invite you into this work. 
There are some national efforts underway now, CS for All being one of them. Uh, Scripps is actually providing uh, a site for a convening of the regional CS educators as part of this CS for All effort. And furthermore, National Science Foundation, their funding of SIZE, which is Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate, they are now requiring broader impacts, outreach, and education as part of their um, funded grants. And cr the Create STEM Success Initiative and Birch Aquarium at Scripps can help PIs with that outreach and education piece that will make their grant proposals more competitive. Okay, I see people nodding, that's good. <laughs> okay, another value, community and collaboration. We are really a part of our community in a unique place with a unique history, a wonderful present and bright future. We're embedded in scripts at UC San Diego and we collaborate with integrity and striving for mission impact. Generations of, of people have been coming to the aquarium and in connecting with the local community, we have learned about this wonderful opportunity that's happening at La Jolla Shores at Kellogg Park, which is also a much beloved local space and, and is used for our aquarium programs. This project is called The Map and it's organized by the Walter Monk Foundation and Mary Coakley Monk is in the corner there with the lead artist Robin Brailsford. And this map will be 3,000 square feet with mosaic tile representations of about 100 species that you might see offshore right here in La Jolla including this 15-foot uh, juvenile gray whale representing JJ, the gray whale that was rescued about 10 years ago. Here you can see the work in progress, and there's Walter sitting there underneath the dolphin. And we've connected this map project with our aquarium staff to engage in a conversation about how can, can the map depict meaningful ecological relationships and how can our aquarium education programs use this map at La Jolla Shores? And here's Robin Brailsford and Wick Alexander, the artist talking about that map. And another way that it connects with Birch Aquarium is that we interpret the habitats and ecosystems that are right nearby, very local. This is the view um, across from La Jolla Cove and the, the clam over to uh, UC San Diego campus. And our vision is to really connect people deeply with this place, with the animals of this place, with the relationships among those animals, to tap that emotion of biophilia, that attraction to nature, that love for nature, and I'm gonna show you another picture now that you, you can't share with anyone else until January. This is one of our design studies. Again, not expanding, but really using our physical space in new and different ways. And I wanna draw your attention in particular to this, this edge around our east and, and south uh, boundary of the site where we envision having enclosures of animals that represent cove to canyon. So the hyperlocal, right, right offshore here, the, the animals, including the sea turtles, the Garibaldi, the top smelt, all of them. And so the invitation that I extend to you is to think about how we might build additional platforms to connect people deeply with this place, to make them love it, to make them care about it. And might we imagine a, a kind of platform like NPR StoryCorps, maybe a multimedia platform that, that invites people to share their stories in audio, video, photos, text, representing multiple perspectives, personal experiences, and giving us insight into life right offshore. 
While I'm here, I want to share a little more about um, some of our vision. We, we expect that this will change. This is first round uh, design studies. But in addition to um, Cove to Canyon here, um, we intend to extend a, a shade structure over the entry plaza. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like from the inside in a little bit. So we have rain and shade protection while generating solar energy. Um, in the Cove to Canyon, we want to represent the submarine canyons offshore here, the Grand Canyons of La Jolla, and invite people to play with the physics of water, to play with, the, um, with watery phenomena in this space. We'll have a canyon cafe that links the terrestrial canyons with the submarine canyons. <coughs> We'll have a, a sensor network trail that, that has sensors distributed across this trail that connects people with, with our, our uh, earth process sensing, like seismic activity, with our atmospheric sensing equipment, with our ocean sensing equipment, using radar to detect when, when there are boats in the marine protected areas that shouldn't be there. We also envision a kind of multi-sensory pier here that connects with Scripps Pier and gives people um, direct experiences that, that they might have on the pier. Again, playing with data and, and using those data and transforming them into um, sonic experiences and visual experiences. And at this corner, a kind of behind the scenes look at our life support systems and practices for animal care and conservation. So the invitation is to, to use our values of community and collaboration to connect people deeply with place. Our value of sustainability. This one refers to both financial sustainability and environmental sustainability. We are a mission-driven organization, but if we're not financially sustainable, we can't do that, that mission impact work. And all of the, the net revenue that we generate is channeled toward our mission, which is focused on local and global sustainability. And this mission, we connect understanding to protecting our ocean planet, is really all about sustainability. And our focus with this aspirational mission is we want to engage people in climate science. That's the understanding part and climate action, that's the protecting part. We recognize that this is a complex and challenging aspiration, and we're in exploratory phase right now with a, a few projects, including working with Professor Keith Pozzoli, who's, who's here today, with his science communication course, and inviting his students to work on campaigns that take climate science and inspire action and support action for people in, in our community here at UC San Diego. We're also working with Professor Ramanathan and his collaborator Fauna Foreman on this course called Bending the Curve. Maybe you've heard of this UC-wide initiative that's about understanding the real state of our climate, predictions for the future, and a set of actionable solutions that, that we as a university, we as the state of California, and we as humanity on this planet can undertake to, to bend the greenhouse gas emissions or those, those warming gas emissions from a continuous upward trajectory downward. And Scripps Institution of Oceanography is engaged in global research, pole to pole and everywhere in between. And that presents an opportunity as well as a challenge. For example, we've got people deploying to Antarctica tomorrow engaged in, uh, in research there to help us better understand the planet. And to give you a little taste, so this is Matt Siegfried's um, 360 video, which I'm showing you obviously on a flat screen. To give you a, a, a view into this world of, 
of researchers going to extreme locations to answer their scientific questions. Well, what I wanted to show you <laughs> was this 360 video shot by Matt Siegfried on his, his deployment to Antarctica last year and, um, and give you a sense of, of his lived experience coming out of this plane and walking out onto the, the ice as far as you can see. Bright white. They're, they're going there tomorrow for six to eight weeks. This team of four people going out away from the big camp on snowmobiles. They'll cover 800 to 1,000 miles. They'll be digging holes every day, putting magnetometers in the ice to try to detect subglacial rivers and, and learn how that water flow underneath the ice may influence the melting of the ice and sea level rise that we might experience here. Um, so follow Matt. He's, he is quite a rising star. And some researchers go to warm places like coral reefs. And this 100 Island Challenge is a, a massive research project undertaken by um, Stuart Sand and Jennifer Smith and their labs and collaborators to understand under what circumstances can coral reefs bounce back from these warming and bleaching events. And this better understanding can inform our management and protection of coral reefs. And um, Stuart Sandin and Jennifer Smith are using new technologies um, such as uh, the stitching together of digital images to create point clouds where they can create then 3D digital models to extend their research in the lab. So their inquiry into the diversity and abundance and change over time of coral species is not limited to their dive time. Now they can they do that analysis back at the lab. And um, some of you might know Vid Petrovic. Uh, Vid has created what everyone else refers to as Vidware to, um, to create this structure from motion. Another resource that we're drawing from is the Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation, which is bridging research, climate research, with people, policy, education, and communities, and linking the local to the global. So again, how do we manage complexity in this space where at the aquarium people come to see cool ocean animals? And our challenge in making our, our commitment to sustainability relevant and resonant with people and communities is to focus on climate and link that to environmental justice because that's, that's how people feel climate change. And we're seeing it now where the, the people who are suffering most due to a warming planet are, are often the people who are most impov impoverished and most underrepresented in um, decision-making circles. Okay, one more story. Expressing our value of innovation and play and our, our striving uh, for excellence and continuous learning. We worked with the Envision Maker Studio and the Jacobs School of Engineering um, for two summers now on the summer engineering with Envision, a summer experience with Envision. Oh, yes. <laughs> Some of our students are here, as well as um, the faculty director of the Envision Maker Studio, Nate Delson. So in this project, we engaged in an exploratory design process where we didn't define the specific design outcome, but rather a set of requirements. And those requirements include physical exploration, social interaction, aesthetic delight, and conceptual beauty with a focus on waves, physical waves. Very soon after the, the program launched, I think it was the beginning of week two, 
Birch Aquarium, as the client organization and partner in this project, hosted design jams, where we got to hands-on making straight away. We used rapid design and prototyping with small teams that mixed and matched and changed in composition. Um, the students explored the space and they mapped the space in multiple ways, looking for examples of physical waves, um, annotating where they experienced sound waves, what was the sound environment like. And we used different approaches to design, bottom-up design processes where we played with materials, we played with phenomena, and then we sort of reverse engineered the, the concepts by looking at what concepts were perceivable in those materials and phenomena. And we also used top-down design where we started with the idea and then sought to give form to that idea. And um, we also, uh, early on in the program with the design jams and field trip to Exploratorium, we brought our UC San Diego students together with some of our staff at Birch Aquarium at Scripps. So there could be a, a mixing of perspectives and a sharing of ideas. We learned from the experts at the Exploratorium and we learned by making, by doing. And back at the Envision Maker Studio, which maybe some of you have seen over in the SME building, it's an amazing, beautiful space, the students proceeded, uh, proceeded in their work with, with their mentors, uh, Jesse DeWald, who's the, the uh, staff director of Envision, and uh, Gabby Shafson and Mark Liu, to make low fidelity prototypes and high fidelity prototypes and using these prototypes to filter the ideas and choose where to focus for the final uh, culmination with the project. And this, this filtering process focused on experience, on the user experience. Again, looking at the physical, social, aesthetic, and conceptual, and connections with script science. And the ugly duckling prototype one because of its potential in all of those realms. And the, the, the team, the students, and the mentors continued with this work. They determined when they had to pivot. Oh, you know what? Maybe I should tell you a little bit about what this is. This is a, an interface used to represent a, a, a sound wave form demonstrating wavelength and frequency by, by sliding here. And the experience was about listening to a tone and then matching that tone with the waveform as an interface. And when, when we um, got to talk with the students about this, we said, well, you know, um, the work that's happening at Scripps is with natural sounds. Uh, the sounds of animals in the ocean. And, and a pure tone, while it's easier to, to match in a, an interactive exhibit, is not typically found in nature. Is there a way that we could use natural sounds? And because of the engineering challenges associated with that, the team determined that they needed to pivot and move from matching a tone to finding a frequency range. And they proceeded with making um, these wonderful prototypes. They're uh, working on, in, on hardware, software, and user experience. And they did user testing throughout their design process, including getting input from, from Birch Aquarium staff um, who have deep experience in interactivity and making things rugged for use on the floor. And then finally, the, the final design presentation with Professor Delson here at Envision and um, selecting uh, a sound, listening to the complex, noisy, ocean, sonic environment, and then using this interface to narrow in on a frequency range to remove the noise and, and filter out those um, those sounds that are, are not in the same frequency as the animal sound that, that we're seeking to match. And uh, here's our beloved Walter Monk, who turned 101 years old last week, father of modern oceanography, wave expert, and wanted to learn from the students how they built this exhibit. <clears throat> 
Okay, one more secret photo or image. <laughs> so we want to invite you into this innovation and play space and help us imagine and give form to this space, which is a sort of a, a combination of exploratorium-like interactive science center and the hydraulics <coughs> lab at Scripps Oceanography, where we invite people to make things, to invent, to play with phenomena, and to learn how the world works. So opportunities for engineering and computer science here as well. So every day, like I said, we ask this question, how do we manage complexity? And one way that we're doing that is by focusing on shared goals, critical priorities, and our values. And in all of this work, we must find the best ways to express our commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion as well while we express the mission of UC San Diego, which is educating, generating, and disseminating knowledge and creative works, and engaging in public service. And I invite you to be in touch with me if, if we've piqued your curiosity and, and would like to start talking about future collaborations. So, <clears throat> Birch Aquarium at Scripps, the Create STEM Success Initiative, we invite you to seize this opportunity inherent in, in the complexity to pursue our shared goals and interests, to use human-centered design principles and ecosystemic thinking, to engage our university community and the general public to deepen understanding of our planet, how it works, how we fit in, and to catalyze action in how we care for our ocean planet and how we care for each other. And now I'm open to your questions.